All right, let's get this going today. Hey, so I'm doing this kind of, wow, this is hard to do. <laughs> I got this in my hand, like my Stetson. You know, let me turn this down. Got some music playing in the back. Crazy. Uh, so yeah, I thought I'd do a video. Uh, wow, this is hard to do holding this thing. And that light behind me is terrible. Anyway, uh, I'll do it, doing a video on uh, my gear. Like what I do to record trumpet and flugelhorn. So if uh, you watch any of my videos, maybe you know this, maybe you don't. I record tons of um, kind of hip hop, lo-fi, beats, jazz kind of stuff. Um, so let me show you, you know, I'm sure a lot of people would be curious as to how this works. I know when I got started, um, I was really curious on how this stuff works. Like, you know, what do you use? Is it just a mic? You know, is, is there anything to it? So let's, uh, let's kind of get into this because there's quite a bit to it. I'm gonna flip the camera so that you can, uh, I guess, see the stuff that I'm talking about as opposed to uh, me just explaining or describing it to you. All right, so let's start with the microphones. So I have, uh, this is a Rode NT1A condenser style mic. Uh, tried and true, sure, SM57. See it there, 57, there it is, man. I don't know if you can see that Rode. Uh, it's yeah, it's kind of hard to see that. Anyway, uh, then I have the uh, the Shure SM7B, which I kind of use for everything. That's that's a real universal. Look, there's a whole bunch all the different mock pieces I cycle through as I play. Um, so typically, of these three, this is the one I'm using the most these days. Um, but I do like to use different mics depending on what I'm doing because it can be kind of cool to mic things differently or mic things together uh, with different mics because obviously they have a different sound um, so you get like a thicker that that's one of the tricks i think is that not only is it good to change horns to change mouthpiece but to change microphones is also pretty handy in terms of getting a variety of sound if you're going to be the sole person playing all the horn parts like i am um, and that's one of the reasons i have lots of different guitars too because it's it's interesting to try you know, a similar amp setting, uh, but with a different guitar gets rid of a lot of the, uh, th there's some problems, uh, you know, w when you record like in unison, you get like some weird dissonance and, and things like that. So same with horn. If I play just the same thing over and over and over and over on the same mouthpiece, same horn, same microphone, it gets a little bit strange because it's all the same tone and they get in, in the way of each other. So anyway, get yourself a decent mic any one of these is good. I mean, this is like a hundred, maybe a hundred bucks at this point, the, the 57. I have a 58 somewhere too, the, the vocal mic from sure. Um, the Rode, I don't know, a couple hundred bucks. And I think the, uh, the sure was closer to 400, maybe 350, something like that. But this is just an, an amazing microphone. Oh my gosh. I mean, for podcasting, for vocals, just singing vocals and for horns it's got a massive amount the thing you got to keep in mind with a trumpet or a flugelhorn is that it's super loud in terms of decibels so if you're going to do any kind of close miking of anything you got to have a mic that can handle a really loud volume uh, before it starts to distort uh, anyway you can see on the screen there I'm, I'm a logic guy so there's a tune i got going on ready to listen See the horn part? Right, let's watch. We'll go back to a horn part. There's some horns right here, eh? That's what it sounds like. Woo! <laughs> Alright, so let's move on to some of the outboard gear. So, here's my preamp. Uh, well, look at my cool, my daughter made that for me. That's my name, Garrett. 3D printed trumpet. Anyway, uh, let me turn this down. So I, although the Scarlet has a preamp, this preamp has a tube in it. Uh, this is the Cranborn Audio preamp. So I, I really like this thing. It's pretty cool. And this Mojo, oh, oops, sorry, up there, this Pete, man, you can really hear that. Um, and it's got some other ins and outs in it that's kind of nice too, so I can run my guitars and bass through that. So that that's pretty cool. Um, but then we get into uh, some of the more, some of the cooler stuff. I'm a big fan of uh, warm audio products, so 
Uh, they're affordable analog, you know, like the EQPs there, you know, th those tube EQs, I mean, they're real tubes. There are tubes inside of those, so they sound noisy, but man, it's hard to explain how good that thing sounds until you hear something through it. <laughs> but man, does it sound good. Uh, but it's different. Anyway, I like to use this outboard gear. So here's, uh, a, you know, for left and right, there's a nice little uh, WA-76 uh, limiting compressor that I use on mostly on bass. Uh, then I have the bus compressor there that I typically have the EQ going right into that all the time. But as you can see down here, I have what's called a patch bay. And all the ins and outs of all this outboard gear are plugged into that. So you can then take a patch cable and kind of connect everything any way you want. Uh, but again, I use this whole top section for mastering for the most part. So I just use it as a stereo channel. And then down here, I have some independent compressors. So this is this is actually a really nice, the Art uh, Pro VLA2. That's a really nice compressor. Um, it's stereo linkable, but it's also, uh, you can use it mono. So you, it's technically, it's two mono compressors, uh, tube compressors. And again, tube, not as much like the warm audio tube, but you know, it's got 12 AX7s, the little tubes in it, not the big giant ones. And then this Joe Meek, uh, the SE 2.2, I think this is a version two, is what that dot two means. Um, this is a really nice stereo bus compressor too, uh, solid state, but really gives it some nice character. So these items I have here are what I can afford from an outboard standpoint, because you know, if you start looking at analog gear, it can be, I mean, you know, Crate, like one compressor can be 10 grand you know they're, they're just crazy and it's just not affordable for a guy like me <laughs> but you know that being said i like to do uh as much as i can with what i have so i'm turning this around because it's super annoying sorry wow this is probably the shittiest video i've done <laughs> and i apologize for that but you know i'm holding the camera here i don't know maybe that uh, was useful to you maybe that was something that you were looking for but you know, it's pretty simple. I just record what I record right through a mic and I've kind of garnered more of this gear over time. Uh, you know, I bought like uh, the preamp is kind of newer. The uh, the Shure SM7B, that's a newer mic. I did a lot of my stuff with that uh, Rode NT1A uh, and the SM57 uh, for a long time before I upgraded to, uh, you know, a better or what I thought might be a better setup for me. So, just, you know, use what you have, I guess, is what you, you get better and better at uh, just trying things out and, and just repetition starts to teach you like, okay, this is a good distance for me away from this particular mic and this mic works really well. You'll hear a lot of engineers talking about stuff like that where they know what mic to try for a user, uh, for, you know, for if you're a singer or, you know, what kind of mic you might use on a guitar amp, things like that. Um, it only comes through practice. I mean, you can read about all this stuff, but really in the end, it comes down to what you want your sound to be. And I think that's as essential as the instruments themselves in building your sound is because the translation of what you're playing through all of this outboard gear is ultimately what you're going to sound like. And, you know, air quotes, your sound will be. Um, and even if, you know, Miles Davis came to my house and played through this stuff, he's going to sound different, right, than I would. Even if we're playing the same horn, you know, that, that whole thing is so true. So, you know, keep that in mind when you're thinking about your sound, if you, if that ever comes across your mind, your part of your sound is the equipment that you're using. That's not necessarily, uh, directly musical. It's, it's kind of like the ambiance to, to some degree, you know, the mic choice can be a big deal. Um, the preamp can be a, a really big deal. You know, what kind of preamp it is, how you use the preamp, what you're plugging that preamp into. Uh, and then, of course, you know, all the plugins and all the effects that you put on after the fact, you know, while you're in the mixing process has a, a huge amount to do that. And I, I try to be subtle with that because I come from a place where I, I want things to sound like if I were to ever play this stuff out in my mind, which I never will. But, you know, if that were to ever happen, my goal is that what I've done here is achievable live meaning it's not so many tracks and so many nuanced little pieces and parts and punch-ins and edits and all that stuff that you'd never be able to actually play it. You know, everything that you hear me play on, on any real instrument, so trumpet, bass, guitar, any kind of vocals, all that stuff is is 
what I'm capable of doing. It's not edited, it's not changed. It, it's just what I can play. So that to me is something I've tried to remain pure with, you know, and, and not get too crazy. Now I do other genres of music as well, where being creative in the sound design world is the bread and butter of those particular genres, like say ambient. I love ambient music and I have a whole thing going on in the ambient realm um, with under another artist alias. Um, and that, I spend hours tweaking sounds, cutting, editing, using crazy effects to manipulate the sound, stuff you'd never be able to do live. I'm not even doing it live to begin with. I'm playing a chord and then chopping it all up, you know, turning it backwards, you know, doing a render of it with just huge wash reverb and then taking that and making a sample out of that and replaying it. Just crazy sound design stuff. But that's not what I do with the live instruments. So all that live stuff is, that's me playing what I can play. <laughs> so if you ever get bored with my stuff, that could be why, because I've reached a limit in terms of my skill and capability. But uh, that is what I, I could play in. Uh, you know, we, we could actually play this stuff live if I had a band or whatever of just pretty good musicians, I think could pick all this stuff up. It's none of it's really hard. So, uh, but I like to stay true to that on the, uh, the, the more acoustic side, like, you know, the things I'm playing trumpet on, I like to keep that stuff kind of real. Uh, but you know, I guess it doesn't matter. I've sent a lot of horn parts out to different producers and they've chopped them up and done all kinds of really neat, interesting musical things with them. And I think that's really cool as well. Uh, it's just not where I've kind of gone down in terms of the road and what I think makes me unique or, or just what feels comfortable to me when I make music. This is how I do it. So I don't know, maybe that helped. Maybe that made you annoyed because I have all this gear that <laughs> maybe you don't have. Uh, or maybe you're laughing at me like, why would you get all that stuff when plugins are so awesome? You know, I guess, again, the answer is, you know, whatever's right for you and whatever you feel like doing is is, is good enough. So just uh, get out there. The important thing is to, to do something with it and, and share your music and your art and your gifts and whatever you got to offer with, with everybody else. Because I enjoy listening to other people. I hope people enjoy listening to me. And, and you know, music's a great thing. All right. See you.